wired on the sound. <laughs> I don't mind. I, I like women. <laughs> oh. Okay. All right. <laughs> welcome to Kelly House, and welcome to our first um, Sunday afternoon with program this year. Uh, we are having our talks in conjunction with our exhibits this year. And what we have going on right now is a dark and stormy night, and it talks about the shipwrecks of the coast uh, during quite a period of time. And uh, today we welcome Robert Becker, who is a uh, docent at the Cabrillo Lighthouse. Yeah, he and Katie moved here 10 years ago in 2005. And they live right next to the Cabrillo Lighthouse, right in that territory. And uh, having a PhD in English, Robert knows how to do research, and he has been a, a teacher at uh, Northwestern and uh, the University of Chicago, and happened to come across um, the frolic. And in another life. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Thirty-five, forty years later. Is extremely knowledgeable about the topic and how all the pieces of the puzzle fit together, and how the frolic is really the one uh, event or object, whatever you might say, uh, that really is the root of, of the pioneer Mendocino, of Mendocino. You can actually point to the wreck of the frolic and say, ha ha, that's when it all started. So we'd like to welcome you here, and we're very lucky to have you. My and, pleasure. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing about this. Thank you, Judy. Some myths or beliefs that you could see as themes to think about. I have stories to tell, and stories require tension, questions, puzzles, characters. I've got a whole slew of wonderful characters, um, including some that are alive. In this room, people dragging <laughs> cannons around. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I have significance, and it's a significance that I've developed over the years, from a small shipwreck story to a much bigger story. And so when people come, I'm there uh, at the lighthouse, Point Cabrillo Lighthouse every Tuesday. When they come, I try to lock in to what they're interested in. And my latest ploy is, do you want to know how California was born? The frolic did not cause that to happen, nor did the frolic. So these are some beliefs, OK? Mendocino is not the first European name for this town. No, it was Meggsville. Meggs is this somewhat scandalous character who goes off in the night and then comes back later and pays all his old bills. Uh, an early pioneer in San Francisco. Um, it, uh, it also had an Indian name, Bulldom, beforehand. but Because Native Americans don't write as obsessively as we do or make maps. Some of their names are lost. Um, the first local villages were not European. There were Native Americans here. And they had been here for up to 14,000 years. We white folks, at best, uh, there may be some Native Americans here, have been here for 500 years. And that's if we go back to 1542, when Juan Fernandez Cabrillo, or in Portuguese, since that's what he was, Cabrillo, was killed on the way coming up, and they named the point after him to honor him. Do you also know that Mendoza is the antecedent for Mendocino? He was the governor of New Spain, which we know as Mexico. And he authorized this large contingency of ships to go up the coast. So white folks, 1540, give or take a year. Native Americans, 14,000 years. Uh, the gold rush did not make California an American territory. It helped populate, but it didn't make California part of America. The great man theory of history does not really answer to very much of my story. It answers to one element. President Polk writing a manifest destiny agenda, you know that term? The belief, more or less religious, that America had to be coast to coast. It, was a, it, it had all the conviction of uh, how the right sees America as exceptional today. And it got President Polk elected, and he said, I'm going to clear up and make the Oregon Territory, 
which was very ill-defined. Washington wasn't separate in 1850. And in fact, Oregon Territory theoretically went halfway up to Alaska. It had this odd shape because nobody demanded it. It got, re it got re redone by the British when we made that Washington top of the border. But manifest destiny and a president authorized a war, more or less a fake war, a, a, trigger, a tricked war, to invade Mexico. That's what ended up two years later making California, and not just California, but the entire Southwest clarified Utah standing, and Mexico, for the first time, accepted Texas as part of the US. That's what the treaty of, in 1848, um, Determined. And by the way, if I you can ask information questions, you know, like what does that mean during my talk? No problem. Hold the big interpretive discussion for later. I'm going to talk perhaps a half hour, and then I'd just like to have a chat, since that way I find out what you want to know or don't know. But so if I say something like manifest destiny, raise your hand. You youngsters may not know it. I, you know, the older folks learned it in in high school. But it, there's there's a I, I notice when I'm talking to young kids. Manifest destiny. <laughs> um, the frolic wreck did not produce or create Mendocino. It is the only wreck I know of that happened before the town was created. Most wrecks happen after commerce gets going. This is an oddball. The wreck produced the town, in effect, because it drew a salvager. History is not orderly, <coughs> except in retrospect, when we clever humans make patterns, which is exactly what I've done. When I got here, I couldn't understand, I couldn't see the clarity of the patterns. And now I have a simple thesis. Mendocino and the start of, and the lighthouse 60 years later, and the restoration of the frolic, which produces the restoration of the lighthouse in 2000, 1999, 2000, are three chapters. And the first two only exist, as far as I could tell, here. No other place in California frames the gold rush, statehood, creation of California in the 1850s, as does the creation of Mendocino. And thanks to the lighthouse built two years after the earthquake, the second most important episode in California history. There are two, only two really big ones, 1850 and statehood, and 196. Everything else is a wash <laughs> as historic events. The lighthouse is built and was talked about and was funded. So my thesis is, this is the only place I know in California that provides very neat frames to the two most important moments in California history. This is an interpretation, of course. And then has a chat, and those two, by the way, are predictable chapters. They would have discovered the wood near the rivers that flow to the ocean. Wood was in such high demand. San Francisco had run out of construction wood. And there would have been a lighthouse eventually to keep ships from crashing, carrying wood to rebuild San Francisco. The third chapter, Tom Layton is the hero there. And you can certainly see him on the movie. His books led alongside a few other things in the 1990s to the restoration of the lighthouse. That is not predictable, not inevitable, a total fluke. Could not have happened. Lighthouse towers fall down. Fresnel lenses get smashed. So it's interesting. But the first two, I'll stand by my position. I don't know of any place that captures 1850 and 1906 with such a neat and clean frame. Because even though we pivot around San Francisco having no gold, we pivot around San Francisco having nothing to do directly with the earthquake, we provide views of what it was like. And so for me, it's a terrific frame, a capture of, the, of what California history is about, which is to say San Francisco history, which is to say Western history. What about the Russians? Where are they in your... Uh, the Russians? Okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to set up in a minute. Uh, the Russians were here for 100 years. Yeah. And they came down the coast. And then they disappeared when statehood happened because America wouldn't put up with Russians uh, stealing furry creatures. They took out the sea otters. Anyway, so those are sort of the general either beliefs or myths that people accept. Syncretism is the coming of cultures that produces a new idea. That's another theme here. S Y N. Let's make sure I got it. That's what happens when white folks show up in Indian land and start producing a logging industry and developing the, the whole area. 
It's also what happens in San Francisco when a gold rush produces a town that by 1906 had 400,000 people in it and then go, went on to be one of the great cities and certainly one of the great technological cities uh, on Earth. So syncretism is a nice idea of thinking of cultural clashes that aren't always kind to the people who do the clashing, but they end up producing something richer. So those are my overall points. Joseph Campbell, if you're going to have a story, have a big one. <laughs> and that's pretty much the history of what I learned about the frolic and Mendocino and the history of the West, which got me reading all sorts of things. It got bigger and bigger. But let's start at the beginning. Well, the beginning of white European, since I'm not an expert on Indian culture. So let's assume it's 1846. Okay? Russians have been coming down, murdering furry critters, because they were fur hunters alone, not city growers, not farmers. So you have Russian Gulch, a cache, a hidden place for supplies. And Russian River, because they got that far. They even owned Fort Ross for a few years in the 1840s. But they basically came down for profit from Alaska, which they owned until the 1860s, which we bought. We actually bought that one. We bought the Louisiana Purchase. We didn't quite buy the rest of the Southwest. I'll tell you why. So in 1846, there are no Americans in all of the Southwest to speak of. There are some in Oregon. They're moving out there. There are a few traders. There are Californios, like Vallejo. Those are white, Spanish-blooded ranchers, not natives, not Indians, Vallejo being a good example. And there were probably some thousands of them, not a lot. There was the remnants of a mission system from San Diego all the way up to Sonoma or wherever, somewhere up there. But after the Mexicans broke free of the Spanish 30 years before, they weren't so Catholic. The Mexican Revolution was anti-clerical. The country was Catholic. And they stopped kind of supplying and keeping the missions in shape. So San Francisco in the 1846 had six or 800 people. There were probably 50 or 100 Russians coming down, OK? And think of California and why Manifest Destiny applies. There are no Western states, certainly not west of, say, Nebraska. There are no Western states. There's the Oregon Territory that had had people here for some years and was obviously going to be Americanized. So in 1846, the British are still north. Canadians, the British Empire, since we hadn't settled that settled. Texas is not accepted by Mexico as not part of Mexico. There are 300,000 or more, who knows, Native Americans, not particularly uh, about which nobody in Washington knew a thing. And there were many tribes in California and sub-tribes. Because our weather is good and our food supply pretty consistent, and we have hills between tribes. And these weren't the warrior buffalo uh, tribes. These were hunter-gatherers, gentler, quieter people. And they were very decentralized. But there were 300,000 of them all over California. So there were more tribes and sub-tribes in California than the rest of the country. Because in South Dakota, you didn't have 50 tribes. You had one or two. When President Polk and a, an aggressive American political structure decided it wanted California as an outpost on the West Coast, as a would-be trading session, but also as a military protection against attacks. They are surrounded by foreigners, Native Americans, Californios. These are not Americans, Hispanics that had been in the Southwest. So we kicked up. Texas had been part of the US for eight years. We, we, we kicked up a border dispute marched 10,000 men into Mexico since Santa Ana was not a great general. He did win at the Alamo, but Texas beat him and was an independent state. And we marched those 10,000 men in, and with a pretty much, I would say, a gun to their head, we insisted that they sell us the following. Ah! This is Katie Pye, my writer wife. Uh-oh. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Hidalgo? Hidalgo. Hidalgo. Okay. included all of the green. 
just a little speck of soil for $15 million. Okay, and the acceptance of Texas, which kind of stretched out here. So this is the Louisiana Purchase. So half of Colorado, Utah, which is weird to begin with because Mormons were there and nobody knew what to do with them. They don't become a state for 50 years until they deal with uh, uh, multiple wives, 1890s. So they accepted Utah, but more or less we bought California, Nevada, New Mexico, half of Arizona, or New Mexico and Arizona, half, and half of Colorado, and we settled more or less the boundary. This is no small event. It also indicates as my largest frame the, the, the end of the Spanish Empire. Property prices have gone up. Property prices, hello Stuart, yes, property prices have gone up. In five years later, this is the Gadsden Purchase, we bought that to run a railroad, we paid 15 million dollars. 15 million? 12 or 13. I'd call it an annexation, to be kind, okay? Within weeks, or actually a few weeks before the treaty is to sign, Marshall finds gold and the gold rush is on. Completely unpredictable. Nobody knew about gold in California. It was found by accident. That was 1848, early-ish. In 1849, 90,000, 80 percent of whom were Americans show up. Americans populated the state because of gold rush. And in fact, gold and the desire for riches and the gambling, high risk, no fault quality of gold and treasure hunting is part of what the West is about. It's how it affected the whole eastern part of the country, which of course had good Puritan values, hard work, dedication, faith, family. The gold rush could not have been more opposite. And it's materialistic, and it's about pleasure. Certainly, early California, early San Francisco was, a, you know, was a crazy place, with a lot of blackmail, and they had fires every couple of months if you didn't pay. It was very chaotic. So, 1848, we are handed 35 percent of America without any Americans in it, and then the gold rush, 90,000 in 49, give or take a few, and in the next nine years, another 150,000. 300,000 people is not only the largest migration, point-to-point -point migration to a single city in America. H.W. Brands, when I was reading this week, said it's the largest single concentrated mass of people since the Crusades. 300,000 people, and it could have been more. They weren't counting when people showed up. It's a lot of people. New York has a million people. And of course, they all went to the gold rush. When you have thousands of people show up, and they came with money because miners needed to buy equipment. They had to get here, by the way, for six months by going to South America. It took, they had to go around 17,000 miles, and it was grueling, and it was nasty, and I don't know what they were eating at the end of that trip. <laughs> but it was not just dangerous. Now, you could save a month if you went across the Isthmus of Panama, but you'd have all sorts of nasty things, diseases, insects, snakes, uh, criminals. You could probably save a month if you were lucky or less uh, or, or not if you went across from St. Louis. But some of those St. Louis trips west took a year. So they showed up with money in hand and there was nothing to buy. Because the San Francisco gold rush was like every other gold rush. Yukon, Australia, South Africa. Thousands of young men show up with money in hand to buy equipment, which they couldn't, of course, dragged along, and there's in their in wastelands. There's nothing to buy. San Francisco had no town to speak of. Well, only seven weeks away is China. Not seven, six months away. And it was a growing advanced culture. And it could produce bowls, 20,000 of them, and some silks and some mining equipment and weighing equipment. They knew the audience. Well, the frolic comes into play here. It's not in Asia without the China trade. It already is in a big uh, stage. Boston owned, Baltimore built, sent around the horn in 45, built for speed. If you see pictures of it, that's not a great, that's not really the frolic. But with a lot of sail to get from India to China, where the British were executing a very nasty drug addiction plan 
they had taken over India, and remember we still have poppies in Pakistan and North India, they farmed it, and the frolic was fast, fastest ship at the time, could get to China two days earlier, picked up silver, which they were trying to get out of China. China had been selling tea for 50 years. And if you're the empire in charge, you don't want a big chunk of your currency taken out of trade. It inflates the rest of your currency. And just like today, we don't want to have a high dollar if you're a manufacturer in America because it raises They didn't. So they produced a drug plan. They had wars. There was a, this is the 1830s. This is before the frolic goes up. Anyway, the frolic is working for the East India Company, making extremely good money, Boston trade, because of the China trade and the weird um, uh, regulated uh, primitiveness of it. And they had to sort of sneak in the opium. Well, it's five years old in 1850. Middle age for a ship, for a wooden ship. It had already had some repairs. A gold rush seemed like the perfect answer to their needs. One, steam is coming in. Steam, is, st steam engines are just coming in. And so they wanted to sell a frolic, and they wanted to bring, in effect, I'll use $1,850 multiplying times 30, $80,000 of goods, known targeted goods for miners. They knew the audience. Yes, they had delusions of selling the ship. That was a delusion. Everyone, every bank clerk was rushing off to the Sierras as if they were handing out orange-sized pieces of gold. They weren't. For the first couple of years, you worked really hard, and you could come up with flakes. And you could make a lot of money. I mean, there were, if you hit the right piece, you literally could have pounds of gold. And an ounce was worth $12 or $15. That's about four or $500. So a few early people made money. Then it got harder because the flakes were invisible, the easy stuff. And they went to plaster mining. Then they went to hydraulic, where they had huge hoses that took mountains down, end of the 1850s. And only industries made business uh, made money there because it was industrial at that point. You had to, you know, it took a lot of capital to produce a steam engine with a huge water uh, hose. The frolic takes off in June from China, wanting to sell itself and wanting to move its eighty thousand dollars of goods, which would have been worth two or three times that. They knew that the you know eggs were three dollars. On board were 6,100 bottles of Scottish ale rebottled in China that would have had a value of $2 or about $50 to $70 in our terms. Why? Because at the end of a week of, mine, of gold mining, which was very difficult work, half the body is in snow melt, and in the summer it's 110 degrees, and in the winter it's half the body in snow melt, and then it's 42 degrees, 14 hours a day. They would have spent a tenth of an ounce and bought a bottle of beer. 6,100 bottles is $300,000, modern terms. It's a treasure. And it was only 6,000 of the 80,000 on board. Frolic was built for finished products. It's a fast ship. Shows up thinking it has another 50 or 60 miles. That was the error. Shows up off of the San Francisco coast. All it had to do was not hit anything. Turn right, and it would have gotten to San Francisco. Okay, and it was had a very competent captain. I can talk more about Focan. He was written up by in Richard Henry Dana's two years before the mast. He was a competent, sophisticated captain. There were uh, technology on board indicating it kept the frolic up. And he doesn't know since nobody is here. Okay, Seattle is almost non-existent. Eureka has you know a few hundred people. San Francisco has 800. There's nobody in California. And there's certainly there's no shipping and no knowledge of what happens when you show up to a continent. And what they especially didn't know about was haze or fog in late summer. So even early June, they arrive in late July, only six or seven weeks. Not bad from China. And they hit a rock at 9.30 at night, thinking they had another half day of their two-thirds sail. They actually hear it. There were good sailors. They turned left, and in front of a cove, which is where the frolic is, there's funny eddies, and it pulls them back against the rock. Lose their rudder, start losing money, uh, taking water, and they sink. They're sinking. And Focon makes the rational choice. All the characters in my story make rational choices. And the early heroes are Focon and Jerome Ford and the early settlers. Five, six men. These would have been Asian, so three American officers and 25. 
They take off in boats. They end up at Mendocino. They dump some people here. We don't know what happens to them. And they do eventually get to Fort Ross in San Francisco eight or ten days later, barely out of food, barely out of drink. But they make it. And it becomes known, and there's a little note in the paper, the Alta California, kind of an insurance note, frolic lost, and nobody was going to come check. This is the other side of nowhere. So no insurance was at issue. And the captain was pretty much like a judge or a doctor. Captains were highly respected. So that crew gets to San Francisco and lets it be known that there is a shipwreck. What I don't think Focon, or we can't assume Focon knows, is that the ship doesn't sink and that these other five men on board turn the ship around. It's at two-thirds sail. He writes that in his letter. And when he gets to San Francisco, he writes to his bosses. And that's the famous letter, lost at sea, not my fault, bad weather, or some kind of fog. File for insurance. My theory is, based on what I've talked to, I did interviews um, of, uh, there were professional divers here, archaeologists, maritime archaeologists, this group. And two of the three for sure, it's not clear about Charles Beaker, said ships don't wander in and land right next to land. There was a history channel on this puzzle. How did it end up perfectly positioned that those five men who didn't swim, sailors didn't swim in 1850, if you didn't have a ship, in the middle of the ocean, swimming isn't going to do it. Not to mention the fact that water is 52 degrees. Maybe they could have swum 100 yards, but not much more. Muscles get tight. So they did what was rational. They parked it next to the headland. It did not sink. What is exceptional about that is it's open to salvage, without which Mendocino doesn't get discovered in eight months. There's no reason to come here. There is no reason for a white man to come to Mendocino. But Jerome Ford does, Ford House. He works for Megs. Megs says, hot foot it up there. Get that beer alone. That would have been a fortune. If he'd gotten 10% of that beer, he could have retired. 6,000 times $2, that's $12,000. Houses cost $300. $1,000 was a lot of money. So. The frolic is sitting and open to salvage. And apparently, and this is a little unclear, Tom Layton is my source here, uh, Focon is in San Francisco waiting to get a ship back to Asia. And here's about the frolic that hasn't sunk. Not necessarily what he wanted to hear. And he supposedly hires a ship and goes somewhat up. We don't know what happens. He never reports. My guess is he went halfway and said, I'm not going any further. I don't know. Speculation. Nevertheless, a salvageable ship is a rarity. Why? Because if it hits anywhere away from a cove, it gets deep very fast here. A thousand ships have shipwrecked in California and gone off and are never heard from again, except in their manifest, in their names. This one's in 20 feet of water. Focon acts logically by coming to try to sell goods. Jerome Ford is acting logically by coming and seeking a treasure. Uh, Kevin Starr, the California historian, says all of California history is about seeking treasure, not money. I came to go to Berkeley. People come for the weather and to find wives. <laughs> but think of why you came to California. It had some treasure to it, unless you just wandered around. Are, are you saying that Ford came up in a ship to haul the mm -mm. treasure back? No, no, not at all. Ship was not a sailor. So Ford was not a sailor. He's a logger. It's critical to the story that he's a logger because he sees it. No, he's uh, in Bolinas running, managing a, a logging firm. And no, he, he comes by a cart. And the reason he can't come until May, crash is July. They hear about it in October. He's stuck because it rained a lot in the 19th century, like 80 to 100 inches not 20 to 40, which is what we've had, or 10 to 15. 100 inches is 25-inch storms. We haven't had a 5-inch storm yet. So he, want, he is obliged to come by land. He is not a sailor. And in fact, he wants to come by land because he wants to bring a cart to put everything in it. It's not clear if you could come by sea, you could get in. In a cove is a difficult place to maneuver. So yes, he takes off in April or May, takes him 10 days to get here. There are no roads between here and Bolinas. 
Indians aren't leaving their villages, and certainly not to go to crazy San Francisco. There are no bridges. So is there a record of what was on the ship being sold? My, the story that I received was that it was shipwrecked. When, they, when Ford got up here, it was all dispersed and broken. Yes. Uh, it's unclear. Focon, Captain, gets to believe this. May have run into Ford in that area, or at least it was known, that he had a ship of, of uh, essentially almost $2 million of stuff, including beer, including basics for the... I mean, they all knew what was on the ships. They were all bringing stuff for the miners. Everybody knew. And no, Ford comes in a cart, doesn't get here till the rain stops because he's not going anywhere out of Marin County in a cart in the middle of a rainstorm. So he finally does get here in May. The ship never was heavily uh, salvaged. There were Native American silks found. There was some stuff. There were big bowls of, they brought a lot of food. Food was very hard to come by in 1850. Think about it. No di diaries, dairies in San Francisco, no food production. So they had kumquats and they had dry fruit that would last six weeks, plus a lot of minor stuff. So he does get here. And of course, the ship, however well built in Baltimore, and it is well built, has been destroyed by enormous numbers of storms we can barely imagine. Nobody's here to tell him that. There's nobody on email, no post office, no nothing. So he does get here, we think, and he would have seen a mast in the water and the ship was destroyed. There was some local salvage. There were some reports of, there were some traders and you know, people in Ukiah who would have come over. A shipwreck that's abandoned is available. No statehood, no local police, no nothing. Now it's under the auspices of the state of California. It's an underwater state park. You can't take a piece from it. It's true for Point Cabrillo. So yes, he was coming to come by. Anyway, it's a bust. Two failures, a shipwreck with modest salvage, followed by an utterly failed salvage. As far as we know, Ford never saw a bottle of beer. Although the beer and the glass would have been really valuable to the Indians. And it would have popped up nicely. Of course, it was rolled in, so it wasn't clear that it would have. But glass was like obsidian and was really important for their spearheads. So glass would have been useful. The beer they would have liked, but the glass was especially valuable. Because you can chip it into small. And there was some silk clothes. They pulled up some stuff, but I've, they were uh, the Native Americans weren't maritime people. They weren't shippers, boat makers. They could go down and pull an abalone and dry it. And in fact, the reason they came here for 12,000 years and went back to uh, three chop where they shot deer is because protein drove their migration. It's what all Aboriginal f native uh, populations lack. We get hamburger and cheese, you know, easy for us in a manufacturing world. But in those days, they came here to dry seafood. And that's why there are all those mittens. And right off of the Frolic Cove is a waterfall, and a fresh water where you would have rinsed off your abalone or your oysters or your mussels and dried them. And you've had three months, you'd have three months of protein. Anyway, two busts, but on the way home, the logger, Jerome Ford, the hero of the first part of the story, sees what makes him a rich man. He sees construction wood, which San Francisco doesn't have as an oak woodland, technically speaking, like the Central Valley. He sees construction wood, especially redwood, but it doesn't matter. Even Douglas <coughs> fir and cedar and pine, close to rivers draggable with oxen to rivers. The rivers are the critical play. Having a huge piece of redwood, 300 feet tall, 20 feet wide, thousands of board feet, is worthless if you can't get it to a river that you can then, when the winter storms pick up, get to the ocean. That's why every river here was a logging area, and it was crudely done. And they had a technical problem because our land is here and our water is here. That's not a good way to have shipping. <laughs> Sacramento and San Francisco, you can have ships right next to a pier. Even Fort Bragg, which is why it's there, has a mediocre port harbor. It was so valuable. If you go to uh, Home Depot, by the way, Redwood, two by six, eight foot, it's two dollars a foot. It was two dollars a foot in 1852. And they moved billions of linear wood, uh, linear uh, wood lumber in 50 years. I've heard up to six billion just out of this one um, mill. Well, now this mill here, uh, from 1852 to 1912, produced seven billion one hundred and fifty million board feet of timber. Thank you. One mill. 
the number I had heard was from 1850 to about 196 was five to six billion. That's a lot of. <laughs> right, right. Anyway, it was enormously profitable, and Ford gets to be a rich man, ends up retiring. So Mendocino is started the next year because it was a, a, a mill, a, a, I mean, a, a saw that had been ordered and was on the way, and they deflected it here. He drives us on cows. Mendocino gets started as a result of this odd sequence of, at, in, at the time, fairly unpredictable events. But in retrospect, there's a logic to it. You wouldn't have seen it at the time. And he starts Mendocino, 1852. And Mendocino, like the rest of California, is, the divi is culturally divided then. I don't know if it still is. In uh, the, the Presbyterian Church, the one that looks backwards, you know, the main road used to be out there. That's why its front is that way. Um, gets the group gets started, Ford, Heiser, in the 1850s. The church is built by 1870 with a bell. Ford is doing a lot of the, the donating. And in 1870, there are 28 bars in Mendocino. And a bar in Mendocino would have meant more than just a bar. It would have meant um, girls because the miners, the, the loggers, the logging company, pulled in prostitutes to take care of their men on the weekends. Because here are these 30-year-old men risking their life. I mean, there's a picture in the, you know, with a huge piece of redwood, and they're hanging off the redwood. And it took you know, three days to saw this sucker. You could get killed 14 different ways logging with oxen, with erosion, over hills. And you know, they, they could drag them maybe a half mile. Anyway, so Mendocino was a culturally split. Uh, but you could see the difference between pleasure, gambling, immediacy sensual pleasures uh, versus the Presbyterian group that were producing commerce and making mills and running businesses. Bibles. So, right. Well, I don't know if they were banging Bibles, but my guess is it was uh, California is generally more liberal in general, generally nicer than the Indians, for example, although that was, that had exception too. Yes. Okay, what do we got? What happened? You should get a place right off of Mendocino called Island of Joy. <laughs> That's right. That's right. A bridge. A bridge out. So did Fort Bragg, and the finally uh, later when it becomes dry, there's a ups, and they blew it up. So, for me, logging gets going here by chance, especially redwood, as a frame to what early California was about, early West was about finding raw materials, stuff, not making anything fancy. I mean, you're dragging it with oxen. What are you going to make out of it? Ashtrays, moving it to San Francisco and making housing, basically. We did lumber, but there was gold and silver, iron, copper. San Francisco is the funnel from everywhere, from uh, Canada to Mexico. All those raw materials, because San Francisco was the only town, and it has a perfect world-class harbor. So for me, this whole beginning, this odd sequence of an early shipwreck, a town, a logging industry, is a frame on what California was about. Crude, primitive, but resourceful. We become a state between the time the frolic crashes in July and the end of that year. And it was hard to become a state in 1850 because there were 15 slave states and 15 non-slave states. We were a number 16 non-slave states. There were Southerners here in the 1850s who wanted to make California, at least Southern California, and all of the South, slavery, slave areas. But because most of the 90,000 people or the 300,000 people who showed up here were from the Northeast and were not interested in slavery, it was an interesting battle. But we were not slaves, but we messed up the balance. We also anticipate and to some extent cause the Civil War. What those Southern senators fighting for plantation slavery saw is that all those Western and upper Midwestern states were going to become part of the Union, and none of them were going to have slavery. Maybe Kansas, maybe Missouri. And if you get enough senators, they would have eliminated. I mean, they saw it coming. Because it always, I always n remark that uh, uh, Lincoln, when elected, who said, I'm a lawyer. Your property is protected by the Constitution, three-fifths of a slave. I cannot abolish slavery. It is against the Constitution. Uh, it, within a month, they're firing on Fort Sumter. It wasn't just Lincoln. It was that they saw the handwriting on the war. So you can see how this is already getting you know, kind of larger. 
how Mendocino becomes a frame on what are the dynamics of the West. And so we begin with a little lighthouse, we begin with a shipwreck, and we end up with Mendocino, and that it becomes a frame on the birth of California, and to some extent the West, which is exploiting natural resources, we're still doing it, not very nicely. If there is no China trade, the frolic, and this is a very large frame, British imperialism, China trade, America works under the British. If there's no China trade, the frolic is not in Asia, and it doesn't crash into, into Mendocino. If there's no manifest destiny push, it's not clear why, who would have belonged to California when gold was found. It would have been a mess. I assume Mexico would have had claims and might have gotten more soldiers up here than they did the first time because they had no great development north of the Rio Grande. They had enough trouble taking care of Mexico. Second chapter, 1906, San Francisco has 400,000 people. Half hour? Am I past half hour? <laughs> well, they're st still badly awake. <laughs> they talked about a, a lighthouse in 1902 and 3. There's, of course, two at Cape Mendocino and one at Point Arena. And so there was a big gap. And the earthquake, which devastated the only town of any significance on the West Coast, you can't imagine, we can't uh, re imagine how critical it was that a town of 400,000 people, that's more than most states in 1906, Two-thirds of it burns in a week. Two-thirds! All that wood we've been sending for 50 years. How ungrateful. <laughs> the reconstruction was immense, regionally, locally, federally. And this lighthouse all of a sudden got accepted because it was a congressional expense. Lighthouses are part of what we call homeland security. The money showed up within a year of eight, 1906. It's built in 1908, and it opens in 1909. Lighthouses discourage crashes, which allow Shipments mainly of wood still. All you got to do around here is move up a mile and you got 500 more logs, trees. So we still have some wood. The lighthouse is not oxen dragging logs. It's a four foot high Fresnel lens. It's high tech for 1907. And it costs six or seven thousand dollars. It came from England. Fresnel was a Frenchman who essentially took Newtonian laws of light, which were complicated and would have produced this massive heavy thing, and he found out a way to do prisms so that it could be only eight inches or 10 inches wide. What Fresnel did was make, light, was make the Newtonian laws into a commercial product. $6,000 is a lot of money, probably more like 20 times. And it gets up here, and it's on in 1909, it's on until 1972. And for me, it represents the modern California, high tech, Com commerce, federalism, the growth of uh, the kind of awareness of a whole statewide consciousness that lighthouses here help build San Francisco. And it, it, it is, if my first frame, the Mendocino, is a frame to 1850, there's a frame, and again, a pretty pure one with a lighthouse and with technology to what modern California was going to become, which is making stuff, which is profit which is value added, which is having a lighthouse support commerce. And it's on until 1972. When lighthouses were viewed as a little obsolete, Loran and GPS were coming into, into uh, importance. And true, now you have a $100 piece of GPS, why would you ever need a lighthouse? Aha, the magical, redemptive, miracle third chapter of my story. And that's pretty much what I did, by the way, as I learned about this thing. I made chapters. I got a first chapter, a second chapter, and the third chapter starts with local divers, uh, disc jockey and others in Fort Bragg, finding a wreck about which they knew nothing. You only have to know one more historic fact. Nobody knew anything about the frolic within 10 or 20 years of its crashing. Not the name, certainly not the opium, Boston, none of that story. They wouldn't have known that anyway. Jerome Ford would have maybe remembered the name if he was paying attention. It fell out of history. Why? Because it was a phantom. It never was salvaged. It disappeared. Poof. History is not very good to, on phantoms. It's good on stuff like cannons. And the Freitas's, a local family, pulled up the cannon, 
without any awareness that this was a historic event. They used dynamite to free it. Why? Because the ship was close to the headlands, close to the land. But it had essentially fallen in on itself and gotten covered with everything. It had big pieces, chunks of ballast. The, the clipper brig is shaped like this to go through water quickly. It needs a lot of weight here because it's top heavy. It's got a lot of sail to get high speed. It's very good except in a storm because it falls over. And it's very good if it doesn't have a rock. It's made out of wood. So it had ballast. There was ballast there. And a, and a, a diver found it, didn't know what it was. Then, since it has a slight silvery quality, thought he had hit a gold mine. Chunks of silver this big. Anyway, he did, it, did a, an assay, and it turns out to be pig iron. They used rock. They used whatever was cheapest to keep the weight a ship in a, a top-heavy ship in water. The lighthouse, the Fresnel lens, is turned off in 72. It's still a lighthouse. It has a little beacon, uh, meaning it's an aid to get navigation, which means it's part of the federal system, which means the Coast Guard is responsible for keeping it going. And then three things culminate in the 1990s that restore the lighthouse. One, Tom Layton, knowing nothing about the frolic, because nobody knew anything about the frolic. This is the most written about life, uh, shipwreck in California history. Comes up here. He's a pre-Columbian anthropologist, study of man. He's in San Jose State. And he's told by some rangers, ah, there's Three Chop Village untouched by industrialism by Western hands. That's what he wants. He's a pre-Columbian guy. He wants to study Indians before Columbus or the impact of Columbus. And by the way, if you're interested in this, there's a book called 1491 and then 1493. Brilliant books, the first of which talks about how the Indian culture that Columbus thought so little of was far superior to any European culture at the time in terms of feeding its people, cleanliness, it was, had its brutal side, but the Mayans and the, and the South were quite a sophisticated culture, much more organized, if top down, than anything in Europe. In fact, the Indians thought the British, it thought the colonists were rather smelly critters because they never took baths. 1493, so that's about the fantasy, the delusion that we came upon a, 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 a essentially a failed territory with a bunch of savages. The reason that the um, Plymouth Rock folks had nobody in the coastal area in Massachusetts is that 15 years before there had been a French ship crashing in Maine which opened up diseases. That land wasn't cleared by God as the Puritans thought. It was cleared by previous Westerners. Indians were not immune. They came from Asia. They were sensitive to smallpox. And uh, Anyway, so 1493 is the incredible exchanges that happened after Columbus came, detailing how corn and tomatoes end up in Italy and all sorts of exchanges and sort of like connections, like Burke's connections, unexpected ones. So Tom Layton goes to Three Top Village in 1984 and is told to, that this was a, you know essentially untouched area. And within a day, stumbles on um, pieces of Chinese pottery. If you've been to Cost Plus, they, this blue, if I can get out of my pocket, there we go. Uh, a character in my tradition of doing rational things and finding completely different results, which is what my early story is about, but making hay, at least for it. Uh, so he stumbles across, it ruined his day, it wasn't an untouched village, he had to find another one. What mystery, what is Chinese uh, ceramics doing where it shouldn't be? 30 miles inland in an Indian village. And not just any. It's stuff that has imperfections in its side. It's handmade on a, w a wheel. It's craftsman, artisan, as opposed to modern uh, ceramics, which do not have any of the imperfections. Why? Because they were making it like this. The Chinese in 1848. This is a piece, these are pieces from the frolic. And what he stumbles on is the last and unknown San Francisco shipwreck in a cove open to professional diving. There have been none found that I know of since 1982. And it has to be in a cove, because if it's in the ocean, it's gone forever. He stumbles on a gold mine for an anthropologist. The last San Francisco gold rush shipwreck in a cove that nobody knew about. He's published two books. 
first book, How a Boston Owned Clipper Brig, Built Baltimore Clipper Brig, Crashes in California, Bringing Basics to the 49ers, Having Run Opium for Five Years for the British from India. I consider it a novel. Certainly you can make a movie out of it with a captain, that's a hero. And with Ford is another hero, and all these pioneers. This is a story about ordinary people making history. Other than taking the whole Southwest, all the other people in my story are pretty much ordinary folks. Did you write his book, Western Promo Prehistory, before this one? Yes, he did do a one because he was an academic. These are not academic books. They're very well written. I recommend them. Now, we got in trouble for that. Uh, the second book, I'll, I'll answer that, is about the cargo and the people. And he had to have some novelistic sections to make it. Um, no, he did a book on the, there were like seven or eight um, peach and fungus. They had, the, the Chinese have very conventional uh, formats for their um, ceramics. And he did do a professional book. I, I'm pretty sure that came first. So, Tom's book comes out. Shoot. I think it happened around uh, Monterey, but it's not part of my, yeah, no, it's not within my knowledge. There's supposedly this magical piece they left somewhere in Monterey. Um, there are stories of many people getting to America. The Native Americans were not the first people here. There could have been people, Contiki from the Southwest. There were, there's some African uh, artifacts found in, in the, uh, Eastern South America. And of course, the Vikings did come in the 11th century. Yes, right. So there were peoples here. What Columbus did is he represented an empire. Remember empires are my final largest frames here? Where the current empire, there was a Spanish empire, then there was a British empire. And so um, what Columbus did is he represented the Spanish empire. And he, and he of course, brought a lot of people. Because the first, when he had trouble with the Native Americans, he was nice to them, he liked them, and then they didn't obey everything he wanted to do. They didn't want to become automatic Catholics. And he destroyed a number of them, or worked them to death. And they revolted. So he brought more Spaniards. There were lots of soldiers available. Because they came for gold. I just heard recently that Columbus wanted enough gold to be sent back to Spain in order to restart the Crusades. Now, is this is. This is fairly, this is only two or three hundred years after Muslims had retaken Jerusalem. And apparently Catholic Europe was still feeling that as a loss. Christianity is the only uh, religion that doesn't control its own birthplace, its own historic birthplace. So there were people here. What? Leighton. Leighton. Book comes out in, well, I, the book comes out in 97. But by the early 90s, 92, 94, he's giving lectures. He stumbled on a gold mine. He's, he's not a shy guy. There was a theater production with a very nice presentation by, uh, I don't know how many people might have seen it. I didn't. I read it. With an Indian giving real voice and saying, you know, I'm glad this was great for you guys. It wasn't so great for us. And we didn't have so many murders here, although there was a bounty on Indians in California. It's nasty. But mainly most of them were given diseases or just worked to death. Even in the inland, we've learned about um, slave, indentured slavery well past the 1850s in Ukiah, in that area. So Tom's book comes out, and it's a sensation locally. Not only does it rediscover the frolic story and kind of how, you know, what it meant, it's the Plymouth Rock story for Mendocino, except for a slight difference. We never forgot about the Puritans. It's as if the Puritans had come and somebody forgot about them, and 150 years later, somebody finds a manuscript. That's the story that Tom retold. The origin story, the source story for Mendocino and the Mendocino area in terms of Europeans. And that's what the book was about. Secondly, the Coastal Conservancy, a state buying group, wanted to have, have public access, a park, basically. Um, and the lighthouse being without its beacon, was essentially um, simply housing for the Coast Guard who had an emergency boat. They still have one in Noyo. They've now moved into the switch. So they were using the housing. The houses were kept in pretty good shape. The lighthouse is, is, the lighthouse is closed. And the large motors, the, the gas engines that fed a compressor, the horns were the key point about our lighthouse. 
They're out towards the ocean. The light's in the back. We're a fog station, which is appropriate. We're pushed off sometime. The light, however, was not removed, which was a point of luck, simply out of remoteness, I think. Because the normal thing for the Coast Guard to do after you had a lighthouse that's been off for 20 years in the early 90s is take it down and put it in a corner so it doesn't fall over and you have a bunch of shards. Anyway, Tom's book comes out and it's a sensation and he gives lectures and they redo the beer. The Fort Bragg guys do re redo the frolic ale. And the Coastal Conservancy is buying the land around it, the 270 acres. And uh, some of you, well, not early folks, in the 90s, more affluent retired folks moved, I hear. I didn't get here till 03 or 05. And they had free time. That's the critical thing about retired affluent folks. <laughs> and they restored the lighthouse. It all comes together. Because they really did love the lighthouse. And the, when the frolic story becomes the place to tell the story, which is what I do, it's restored in 99 and turned on. And, sorry, and with a restored lighthouse. Locals, some of you may know more about this than I do, go to the Coast Guard which is a little reluctant to turn on what it sees as obsolete technology. For no lenses, really, it's like wind-driven ships. Well, apparently 100 people and pressure and a completed lighthouse. There was a lot of money involved. There was grants and stuff. Anyway, they recommission the Fresnel lens. That's why it's on. That's why it's been on since 2000. Most unlikely, completely unpredictable. And then the North Coast Interpretive Group got together and the PCLK, Point Cabrillo Lighthouse Keepers, which it runs all of the housing around the original 30 acres, and we are, and we answer to them. The state is not terribly involved. They keep the water system going, and they're good partners. Coast Guard are wonderful partners. When our motor went from the 1930s, it was, by the way, not electrified till the 30s. It was a clock mechanism. So that's why you have three houses. They had to, every two hours, pull up a 90-pound weight. And as the weight went down, you can turn this direction and turn this direction and get a 6,800-pound chunk of glass this is leaded crystal glass, fancy prisms, and metal to turn. Well, in 1937-ish, uh, it was electrified. And um, two or three years ago, the motor went out. And because the gearing was sufficiently complex, they didn't want to reproduce that. So they rewired it. This is the Coast Guard, our good buddies in, in up north. And they rewired it, put it back in, got it backwards. <laughs> Someone didn't get a condenser in. It was going backwards for a while. And then they got it right. So the, in short, out of mayhem, and disaster, which is typical of any early time. And this chapters, this sequence that I've presented, we end up with a lighthouse open every day. Stuart and I and Katie are the docents here. And Wendy, Barry's wife, she will be a docent here. Uh, out of the, all that, we get a certain orderliness. We're a state park now. And we, between the gift shop and the, we have four rentals. The two of the houses are rentals, two in the back. We produce enough cash to keep the place in better shape with all due respect than anybody before us. Right, skunk carriage, but, and the Sierras were just getting, I mean, they had to, for example, clean up the swampy Central Valley first. Then they had to kind of channel the rivers. Well, I know, I you know, know why to get, railroads up here in no, no, but there were, yeah, I, I think, firstly, it was really hard to have a railroad. I mean, there was a railroad at Jug Handle in the 20 years later. Um, but I don't know about railroads out of the Sierras, which would have been. Rebuilding San Francisco. So, so from San Francisco east and south. It was still shipping. It was still shipping. There was not enough railroad. I mean, obviously, there was a railroad in 1868, coast to coast. I was born in Southern California, and I love being here at Bowser Review. There were railroads to there. Well, no, World War One helped L.A. Yeah. because it become a defense area. Well, um, getting water to L.A. <laughs> uh, it, it it had ten thousand people perhaps in nineteen hundred, uh, but we never would. We still don't have a railroad. Not for not for that kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's never been a lot of people here. There, I mean, probably in 1910, there were perhaps 25,000 people because there were 150 people at a lot of these logging areas. Uh, so there was probably a peak then. Um, Pine Grove, which is where you park, was a very rigorous, uh, lawless place with, as I describe it, uh, you know, a, a, a tannery, a 
dance hall, 300 men and a dozen women every weekend. They went with their paychecks. I mean, the miners were very sensitive about providing equipment. So anyway, so no, I, you know, hard data isn't easy to find. There is, uh, right, I didn't know it was lost, but I did hear there were some reports that Ford made to somebody because he reported when he left with the cows and when he got here, and there was some yeah, well, feedback. Yeah, his, his second mission up here. Right. The, the 1852 diary exists. Right. But not the 1852. And we don't quite know if From what... The order. Right, and whether he even met, there's some discussion of whether he met Focan on the way down. He wouldn't have been far in terms of Fort Ross and had a chat and said, yes, there's a ship. But Focan at that point would not have known it was a salvageable. I'm trusting that he didn't overtly lie, that he reported it was lost outside, and that would have been 10 days later. He gets there in August, right? And That's why Anne was asking about the primary source, because the story goes in a couple of different directions. One that Meg's ordered Jerome Ford to come up here to see if there's anything in the cellars. The other story is that, that Ford was managing Meg's mill at Bodega Bay, and Falcon and his group came through there and mentioned it. I think it could have been both. Yeah. He would have alerted. Meggs was a hustler. Meggs was ready for everything. I mean, the fact that he owned a lot of San Francisco real estate, and that was really his plan, and owned a, you know, owned a mill, and it took him years to get rid of Meggs when he took off. There was a complicated legal issues before Meggs and his Oakland partner, who handled the shipping down there, um, took control of the Mendocino Timber Company. Um, but no, it's the, when there were no historians. What? There was a, I forgot his name. He had a business partner in Oakland who handled the shipping when they sh the wood showed up. He was only a part owner. Meg, uh, Ford did not own all of the thing. For a while there, Megs did, but Megs went bankrupt and was a scandal and he owed money. And so it took 10 or 20 years, and Tom does talk about that, before they gave, essentially, they had some investors the, who owned a percent, and then they had basically two managers. Ford ran the, this part of it, he ran the production. But yes, there was a, um, a, a business guy in Oakland who must have handled the shipping. Because once you get it on the ocean, it's, ocean, it's, it's not just limited to San Francisco. You can ship it anywhere. Uh, so do I understand correctly that when a ship crashed, a ship wrecked, then the insurance is going to pay for that ship and that wreckage and that cargo. Anybody could come and salvage that? Yes. An abandoned ship, out-of-state property, is still... Is still open to salvage. So why then was Ford the only person who came up here to salvage? He was the only person we know who came from the Bay Area. We knew about it. That's a good question. As I say, there were some local traders who made weekend trips and picked up some stuff, but it wasn't an easy place to salvage. It was sitting in twenty feet of water, and it was closed. You know, it was in a hull, and the plates and stuff and the beer were all kind of wrapped. Uh, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't sitting on the top. It's possible they did not know what was on board. We don't have any information of that whether Focon explained. Now, of course, since when Tom Layton rediscovers the frolic and ends up back at Harvard and finds out that the Augustine Hurt Company has 50 feet of business paperwork that they sent back in the 1870s from, Hong, from China, I mean, we have granular levels of what was on the frolic. We don't have to have a picture of the frog, but we know in details who made the plates and the size and everything. So yes, no, I think they just, even if you're on an island off of the ocean, out of the state, and you have a crash and it's abandoned, no guy with a gun, it's open to salvage. There is a law of the open sea. And, uh, it's changed now. Yeah, it's changed a bit now. <laughs> but only if you have a country or, or the, with a police force that's there. If you're in the middle of the South Pacific and you have a crash and nobody's around, right. it's not clear. Well, Tom Layton is my source here, uh, and he talks about uh, that um, Ford comes the second time with cows. He has to drive up cows because they needed to have, you know, a, a, a full-fledged farm. Um, that's afterwards. Um, no, uh, th there was some uh, discussion. He did buy some land. There were a, a dozen or so, or two dozen, uh, not pioneers, even before pioneers, yeah, uh, land, landowners. Oh, but there was no land property because there was no county. You had to go to Santa Rosa, I think, to... to Wouldn't Layton have a, a bibliography of where he got his information? 
Yeah, I mean, he, he'd be my source, and, and he, he, he reports that we do have evidence that Ford came and set up the town, and then this deflected um, bill, you know, saw, was shipped up here by sea to Fort Bragg and then carted over here. Uh, an imaginative story for which there's no evidence, right. but it's a speculation. It's, it's all, it's all, it's I, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical because this was not a shipping lane. No, no, I don't think he had to lie. He merely had to say it was lost at sea. Okay, you have to realize there's no shipping here. This is once a ship every four months shows up and turns right. There's nobody coming from China. There is no shipping to speak of. There's no Sa Seattle. So I have to wonder. A, whether the ship was going to be sitting on those rocks for more than 15 minutes, because they would, it would have only been a daze. And so that, for me, assumes a lot of happening. Well, they were just washed over the rocks and then shore? Well, uh, uh, Tom, Tom Layton was stuck with Focon's story, which is lost at sea. And so he had to assume that it went by itself and, cru and floated into a, the right spot. You're out of tape time, so you have to quit now. <laughs> I'm sure we'd love to speculate about more stories, but I think we'll wrap it up now. Thank you so very much. My pleasure.